Hello and welcome to the ninth, I think it is, 18th premiere live stream. Today we have a small panel. We are waiting for uh, Derek Barron to jump on in a couple of minutes. So until then, it's just the three of us. We have um, our return of the Mac uh, part two, maybe even part three. Amog, how's it going? Yeah, it's going okay. It's going okay. It's uh, living in sunny, sunny Virginia. I'm telling you, it's nice and sunny here in London as well. You'd be pleased to 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 hear. And also, then just after jumping in, I don't know if he's ready. Let's go and well, let's go to Kyle first. Kyle, oh, there you know he is ready. Uh, Derek, how's it going? I'm okay. I'm here in Salt Lake. I'm reading dire economic news coming in August. Oh, that's what we like to hear. The banking crash of August 2007 redux. What, what do we think? Is that it? Yeah, I mean, what's good? The unemployment extensions and the and the um, foreclosures and evictions that all ends in July. Um, it, there's no way Congress is going to pass something fast enough to to deal with the initial push. So. Um, uh, we're going to have a nice proper housing crash more than likely and a banking crash to go with it because of CDL um, collateral debt leveraging, which replaced the old uh, CDOs, the collateral debt options. They work basically the same way. And they're based off the fact, that, you know, if a foreclosure happens, they never happen all at once. Except, you know, when they do. That can't happen. As we know, Derek, economic events are normally distributed. They're not distributed like a power a power uh, power function. Normally distributed, that could never happen. They don't clump. Anybody who right. says it doesn't obviously hasn't done it in economics. Yeah, you know we don't have punctuated equilibrium at all times on all things. No, we have gradual evolutionary theory uh, of all things and all time. Right, and finally, let's go over all the way to Botswana on holidays. Kyle, how's it going down there? <laughs> uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm really surprised to have been able to travel out of Calgary. Uh, it's quite a shock. Uh, but I do hear their state of emergency is uh, lifted uh, <laughs> over there. So that's good. Um, yeah, I'm kind of wondering if we should be reading the uh, the civil war in France instead of the Brumaire right now because of this uh, whole uh, Chaz situation in Seattle. Um, but uh, <laughs> let's let's see what we get. I I think as well, like whoever decided to call it Chaz, it's a terrible name. <laughs> it sounds like Cascadian anarchist so you know <laughs> that should be expected it, on many conventions it's like uh it's like uh, a mogul know who i'm talking about but like it's like Chaz and dave that's what i think about every time <laughs> so that's the anybody else reference from way back <laughs> one of them died i think last year do anybody does kyle or or, or or varn do you know who Chaz and dave are haven't the foggiest nope so. British pop Chaz and viewer. Dave are like a, yeah, kind of like a like a like Cockney traditional Cockney kind of kind of uh, what would you call them like piano tunes? Yeah, you know? um, it's like eighties pop, right? Like that's the seventies and eighties pop. That's the. But it's like a folk. It's nearly like Cockney folk music. You know, it's a, it's a weird. They do like uh, yeah, no, they they are uh, anyway. Yeah, they were actually. <laughs> The guys themselves are actually pretty sound, you know. <laughs> the music was pretty rubbish. Um, yeah. um, anyway, it's Capital yeah. Hill Autonomous Zone. That's why it's Chaz. It's not. Yeah, it's it's a terrible name, right? Uh, here we we're, we're on. Last week, people may have uh, heard me losing the plot with uh, all kind of manner of uh, um, dialectical ecstasy, but uh, like I I've, I've calmed down everybody. <laughs> I didn't sleep for about four days. I think I genuinely, I don't know, but I think I genuinely had a panic attack after the morning after Trump's speech. And uh, I didn't sleep for like about four days. So fucking it's amazing what uh, sleep deprivation does to you. It's fucking mad. Yeah. 
um, I was in a particularly foul mood because of stuff going on here and SLC too. So um, I probably won't threaten to strangle as many people today as last week. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's fine. I, 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 sh- I should hope not uh, with this subject matter. It's, you know, should be pretty non controversial. Right. I tell you, do you know what? Fucking, I had to put away. I bought that book, uh, Marxists in the, in, the, in, in the Face of Fascism. And I just bought it and I've been reading it. And between that and the Brumaire and then Trump's speech with all this fucking law and order stuff, I swear to God, it freaked me the fuck out i thought i was going to hear that half of the people the emancipation network there was a chance they'd be fucking fucked out of helicopters into open volcanoes like in chile i was thinking <laughs> the only, only thing i was thinking was like that uh at least like maybe varn or, or sophie would at least drag one of the fuckers overboard with them <laughs> that's, that's what i was thinking that was yeah. my hope if i'm going down i'm blowing that helicopter up like, yeah. Like, like, I might not win, but um, you, actually, you know, I've I've been thinking about it too because I am somewhat worried, not about Trump, not even about these protests, but about when the real economic calamity hits. What's going to happen? Um, yeah. because we've cycled through so much already, and um, I don't know where people are going to go. Like it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Like I don't know where where people are going to channel this into, um, you know. And there are certain things that I worry about uh, right now that I think we are just largely distracted um, by. It. I mean, like I'm not saying Chaz isn't important, but it is a case kind of like when the military kind of gave the Arabs, you know, the Arab Spring people in Egypt, like the keys to the state to have an election, and the police just give you the Capitol Hill. Um, you do have to wonder, like, is it tactical? And are they hoping that you are going to embarrass yourself so bad you lose popular support? And yeah, that was definitely the idea, right? Yeah. yeah. I think they thought I think they thought they would burn it. I presume they thought they would burn the precinct and they didn't. Right. I mean, th- there are already issues and it doesn't – like, like – I've been talking to to leftists in Seattle, and it, it's becoming polarizing there, and it's polarizing in left book in a way that, uh, say the the revolts, you know, the week prior weren't. But um, I mean, it is weird because I'm also I'm studying the collapse of social democracy in the twenties, Tom. So I'm like reading some of the same books, and <laughs> and uh, you know, living through this, and then I'm like, oh, we're we're right, well fucked. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I know. It's like I had to put that book away. I had to put it up on a shelf where I wasn't seeing it. I was like, I need to like fucking like calm down with this stuff for a while. Um, but it, you know, I I think so too. And the other thing as well is like, not even just what's happening now. Like what people need to think about is like who comes after Trump on the Republican side. Tom That's Biden. not looking too. You know, and he's a scary motherfucker. No doubt. I mean, I'm luck- luckily, like Tom Cotton has a personality of run- of a warm spit and a brown shirt, but like, it's it's still worrying because somehow warm spit Democrats occasionally win. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm waiting for us to get. I'm waiting for the anti political moment to turn into something truly scary, as opposed to just clownish and. I mean, clownish can be scary. Don't get me wrong, but but like as we're going to talk about today with Louis Bonaparte, Trump is no Louis Bonaparte. He's not even the farce, you know. He's more like you know the tragicomic clown, um, and he's kind of like, or he's the farce to the farce of Reagan, even, um, and and he's immensely unpopular. Um, right now. And while I thought, you know, a month ago, I would have thought he'd probably win this coming election just because, you know, Biden is about as weekend at Bernie's as you can get and that he seems to be all but dead. Um, That I think maybe even a corpse of, you know, I don't know, like, like the corpse of like, 
Al Gore's dad could probably win now, mm-hmm. but 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 it's not going to do anyone any good. So I mean, like you know, what kind of mess are they going to inherit? And they will not have the keys to do anything to it. Um, and to be fair, that's not Trump's fault either. That's that's you know the last forty years of the American Republic. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let, let, let's let's get going here and jump into this and let's not dwell on, on this current shit show that we have. Um, so this uh, chapter here is titled on Marxist.org. They call it, uh, what do they call it? Napoleon versus, let me see here. What do they call it? Uh, National Assembly versus Bonaparte. So this is going to talk about how uh, Bonaparte basically split up the the party of order, took control, and basically dominated uh, the uh, the parliament from his presidential palace. Um, and we're going to kind of follow how he uses a um, a kind of a secret organization of his own called the 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 Society of December the Tenth or the Decemberists. And how he uses them uh, to basically cause a bit of havoc politically around the place and throw some shapes. Um, okay, so after um, uh, okay, so let me just see here. Um, once they got once they got rid once the Parliament voted to get rid of the universal suffrage, Bonaparte basically came to them and said, "Hey, that's not fair. Now you got rid of a load of my votes. I want like one franc for every every person whose vote is lost." And uh, instead of giving him like six million francs or whatever th- that he looked for, they gave him like two million. And he subsequently used them to basically go out and do some political bribes and stuff all over the place and, and throw some money about. Let's just uh, jump in then, unless somebody objects, we're going to jump in from a little bit down here um, in the first paragraph, nearly towards the end of it. OK, from here. Um, Kyle, how do you feel about doing a bit of reading there? Sure. Uh, all right. So from we shall see later. And okay, got it. Uh, 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 uh. It's hard. Okay, just a sec. Okay, got it. All right, so uh, we shall see later for what purpose Bonaparte needed the money. After this vexatious aftermath, which followed on the heels of the abolition of universal suffrage, and in which uh, and in which Bonaparte exchanged his humble attitude during the crisis of March and April for challenging imprudence to the usurpa- usurpatory parliament. The National Assembly adjourned for three months from August 11th to November 11th. In its place, it left behind a permanent commission of 28 members, which contained no Bonapartists, but did contain some moderate Republicans. The permanent commission of 1849 had included only order men and Bonapartists, but at that time, the party of order declared itself permanently against the revolution. This time, the Parliamentary Republic declared itself permanently against the president. After the law of May 31, this was the only rival that still confronted the party of order. When the National Assembly met once more in November 1850, it seemed that instead of the petty skirmishes it had hitherto had with the president, a great and ruthless struggle, a life and death struggle between the two powers had become inevitable. Yeah. Okay. So this is setting the stage. This is setting the stage here for basically we're going to have Bonaparte and the Party of Order going at it through the Parliament. Uh, let's let's keep let's keep going and have a look at this uh, December the Society of the December the tenth. Okay. Um, so should I just continue reading or? Uh, let's go from this bit here if you see me because okay, it's a lot of the society. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me go on and see if I can, because it's a big, long one. Oh, yeah. Can you read it on my screen or you got your own book, I presume? Uh, oh, sorry. 
I've 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 got it on my screen because it's easier for me to, <laughs> to uh, navigate. Uh, yeah, so yeah. it's this society, right? Yeah. All yeah. Right. Uh, dates. Okay. Yep, got it. And uh, to the end of the paragraph. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this society dates from the year 1849. On the pretext of founding a benevolent society, the lumpen proletariat of Paris had been organized into secret sections, each section led by Bonapartist agents with a Bonapartist general at the head of the whole. Alongside Decay Louet with dubious means of subsistence and of dubious origin, alongside ruined and adventurous offshoots of the bourgeoisie, were vagabonds, discharged soldiers, discharged jailbirds, escaped galley slaves, swindlers, mountebanks, lazaroni, pickpockets, tricksters, gamblers, macaro, uh, brothel keepers, porters, literati, organ grinders, rag pickers, knife grinders, tinkers, beggars. In short, the whole indefinite disintegrated mass thrown hither and thither, which the French call la bohème. From this kindred element, Bonaparte formed the, the core of the Society of December 10th, a benevolent society insofar as, like Bonaparte, all its members felt the need of benefiting themselves at the expense of the laboring nation. This Bonaparte, who constitutes himself chief of the lumpen proletariat, who here alone rediscovers in mass form the interests which he personally pursues, who recognizes in this scum, awful refuse of all classes, the only class upon which he can base himself unconditionally, is the real Bonaparte, the Bonaparte sans phrase, an old crafty roué. He conceives the historical life of the nations and their performances of states of state as comedy in the most vulgar sense, as a masquerade in which the grand costumes, words, and postures merely serve to mask the pettiest knavery. Thus, his expedition to Strasbourg, where the trained Swiss vulture played the part of the Napoleonic eagle. For his eruption into Boulogne, he put some London lackeys into French uniforms. They represent the army. In his December, or in his society of December 10, he assembles 10,000 rascals who are to play the part of the people as Nick Bottom, uh, the character from Midsummer Night's Dream, that of the lion. At a moment when the bourgeoisie itself played the most complete comedy, but in the most serious manner in the world, without infringing any of the pedantic conditions of the French dramatic etiquette, and was itself half deceived, half convinced of the solemnity of its own performance of state, the adventurer, who took the comedy as plain comedy, was bound to win. Only when he has eliminated his solemn opponent, when he himself now takes his imperial role seriously, and under the Napoleonic mask imagines he is the real Napoleon, does he become the victim of his own conception of the world. The serious buffoon who no longer takes world history for comedy, but his comedy for world history. What the national atelier were for the socialist workers, what the garde mobile were for the bourgeois republicans, the society of December 10th was for Bonaparte, the party fighting force peculiar to him. On his journeys, the detachments of this society packing the railways had to improvise a public for him, stage popular enthusiasm, roar vive l'empereur, insult and trash Republicans under police protection, of course. On his return journeys to Paris, they had to form the advance guard, forestall counter demonstrations or disperse them. The society of December the 10th belonged to him. It was his work, his very own idea. Whatever else he appropriates is put into his hands by the force of circumstances. Whatever else he does, the circumstances do for him, or he is content to copy from the deeds of others. But Bonaparte, with official phrases about order, religion, family, and property in public, before the citizens and with the secret society of the Schufterless uh, and Spielbergs, the society of disorder, prostitution, and theft behind him, that is Bonaparte himself as the original author, and the history of the Society of December 10th is his own history. 
Okay, just a note of order, the Schufterles and the Spielbergs were from a uh, Schiller's drama called The Robbers, who pillaged uh, uh, and murdered without impediment or scruples. Um, Okay, right. December 10th, the site of the December 10th. What are these now? Right. What are we going to say about them? Like... Looking at today's politics, are they? Is, is, could we see like elements of of the society of December tenth in like Tea Party and and these type of no, you can uh, see astroturfed or sort of, but no, I mean, I don't think so. Like honestly, leftists have tried to pick these. Explain people why? Because these aren't petite bourgeois. These are. These are people who are desperate, and their desperation makes them reliant on the state. And ever since Mao did his uh, brainwashing, so you're saying that ever since Mao did his brainwashing campaigns against the quote unquote neutral classes in China, it has been assumed that the lumpen proletariat, um, which is the desperate and the dispossessed, would be the org- would be the organ of at least or at least an ally in the revolution. And so frankly, whenever we see mass movements on the left lately, it's been of it's been of students plus these kinds of people, people who you would call declasse. Marx has very little time for this. And this is why it is not, it, he's not talking about petite bourgeois here. Like he's, he's talking about people who, whose primary things are criminal enterprise, grifting, um, being, you know, having nothing to do outside of the army, people who he's talking about like massively structurally sustained unemployed who have picked up other things to survive. And those other things are all are all parasitic. And I think a lot of us like. So you're saying that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I don't know if there's a time delay from mine, so sorry if it's uh, if I'm buttoned in. But so you're saying that the things like the Tea Party and and such kind of um, astroturfed organizations tend to be more petty bourgeois than what Marx is saying is you, the makeup you here. You see, uh, people like this uh, who turn into sort of managers of organizations like Tea Party, like the astroturfers, but the membership is petty bourgeois. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. The membership is like small businesses. It's not like you're not turning to the mafia um, or to street gangs to to form the society. And and um, to be fair, I mean, leftists have largely they don't do this formally anymore. But in the '70s, it was a real thing. Um, and and in the late '60s, where that was seen as the part of society where you needed to recruit from. And the other people historically who thought you needed to recruit from there were insurrectionary anarchists. So, you know, I'm, I'm not so much sure, like, um, like how much of this is, uh, I mean, obviously we believe that, that, that Marx is telling the truth here, but how much of this is also a polemic against like Prodonist and, and stuff at the time as well because of the context for this, for this writing. But, um, you know, look at where these dispossessed classes go when they have a rich patron. Um, You can get them up to anything. And they will do so off of the backs of the majority of society, which, you know, according to Marx, is a working class and the peasantry. So, yeah. And, and yes, you, you might see grifters like this, like high-end grifters like this, who are astroturfing things, I would agree. But that's actually bourgeois and petty bourgeois. They have the money. Like, you know, you don't ask, like, um, con artists to go run, like, you know, low, low-level con artists to go run your, um, when you run your grifting organization. What's interesting about fascism, and I think Trotsky talks about this a little bit, Fascism that made it different from classical Bonapartism, and this was a debate between the right oppositionists and the left oppositionists um, in the 20s and 30s, was that Trotsky thought that um, fascism was kind of a Bonapartism with that uh, that also managed to incorporate the petty bourgeoisie 
and thus was like in Trotsky's um, analysis um, a ball on the top of a pyramid and he thus thought the Molotov Ribbentrop pack was fine because the the class composition of uh, of the base of Nazism was so incoherent that it would just fall apart. And I mean, he may have been right about that, but not before, you know, it killed, you know, 12 million people or more. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, but I don't think, I don't actually think like you, you don't see this in the United States. Occasionally you might see this in like places where there's a lot of Imperial Jack fuckery, like, you know, places we traditionally call it banana republics where like Codillo figures will like basically recruit the mob to hold up their government. And, but that only tends to happen now in places where like, uh, where there's a really strong, like hidden, you know, neo-colonial or imperial boot print from either Europe or the United States and Canada to, to tip things around. Um, and so, I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correlation to stuff in America on this. Um, so, so another thing would be like for us to discuss here would be uh, what about uh, this, the role of secret societies? We, we see them, I don't know, I've been going through like a lot of the, you know, revolutions podcast, certainly in 1848 there, especially in Italy and some of these places, there was shitloads of highly organized secret societies we don't really see this phenomenon around too much today. Certainly not from the left. Like, um, is there is there a role for these secret societies from our just, point of view? Sorry, just a question about. Are you? I wouldn't think like not all secret societies are the same. Like, you, I'm not. I don't. I don't know that you're trying to. Are you trying to equate the society of December the tenth with like a highly organized like anarchist cell? Like, they're both secret societies. Like, no. Some, yeah, no, no, more like a, I'm thinking not like, I'm not thinking about anarchists. You're thinking about thinking like about the, the, uh, the, the Italy, you're thinking about the Carbonari, the right? In in Italy? The Carbonari, yeah. I mean, well, here's the thing, like, I can't remember. the Carbonari. Um, and, uh, Is that the name of them? I can't remember. Yeah, and, and like, that also led to like the secret dictatorship doctrines of Bakunin. Um, Marx, the reason why you don't see it is, both liberals and Marx has, have, have jointly kind of opposed this. Like Marx has always oppo like opposed that. He he let them into the international, but argued against them, and that's what ultimately killed the first international. Um, was the debate over over um, the state um, in Marx's compromise position, and and the debate over um, the the pro the role of revolutionary secret societies and secret vanguards which Marx opposed as being dictatorial and anti-democratic. So, you know. Which is a fair point. What about in... Yeah, no, absolutely. But what about in situations, say, like, where you... where it's, like, severely repressive and you have to go underground? You know, say, for example, like, in Northern Ireland where the IRA was, you know, obviously an underground yeah. secret society. Uh, are like, the uh, like frankly, like the Bolsheviks were uh, exactly. There yeah. was a lot. There was a lot of this in Latin America as a result to the of the turn to the right in the mid century, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's actually something I, I I wonder about because um, I had a debate with an unnamed Marxist group that called itself anti vanguardist that had very very strict secret rules and like you know even of like like its membership internally. And I quoted the communist manifesto at them <laughs> and the, the, and the first international debates. Um, but, you know, they had points back to me about the, even though they were anti-Bolshevik, but about the Bolsheviks and the, they brought up the IRA um, and for oppressive conditions and like the secret, the uh, illegal and secret um, labor unions. Um, I suppose the goal is: Do they stay secret? Like, is are you are you secret as a tacit, um, as a tacit tactical thing under severe repression, 
are you secret because you want to operate secretly in general? And that's a very different, those are very different things. Like if, you know, like the Bolsheviks, you know, we, we I know that most of us are not tr tried and true Leninists here, including me, but the Bolsheviks didn't keep their roster secret once they were not under state repression anymore. Right. And right. that's, that's yeah. generally the case of the groups we've been discussing. Um, Uh, Amoga, are you old enough to remember when they used to allow Jerry Adams on the television, but they used to get uh, a voiceover guy to record his voice? Uh, Amoga's off mic, I think. Okay. They used to do in, in BBC for a while, like the, it was illegal to have a Jerry Adams on the t uh, speaking on the telly or Martin McGuinness. And uh, what they used to do is they would, they would, after a while, they said, well, he could be on the telly, but he, you can't use his voice. So they used to get like a voice actor to voice over it with like a really bad Northern Irish accent. It was very funny, man. You couldn't fucking make it up. Wow. Um, I mean, there is, there. Um, I will say uh, one of the things that we have to deal with that has been brought up in chat, but it's serious because I've thought about it is like, you know, one of the reasons why I think Black Lives Matter went into official like quasi NGO territory and outside of its initial like organizing is all the Ferguson people were dead within what two years? Like all the mm -hmm. leaders. Yeah. Like 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 they were they were kind of strategically outed. And so like um you know and uh and so it, it made sense that you would go into like official NGO and cause you're, you're less dangerous, but you're also way more protected. Um, it's hard to say what, 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 you know, how these secret societies would work. But I, again, like, like, I think the argument is that, that like the reason why the Bonapartists were doing this were not, was not from political um, repression. It was because like, they didn't want you to know what you were doing. And they didn't want to know who was doing it. Like, I mean, it, it's a secret society in the way that, like, conspiracy theorists would accuse the U.S. government of, like, you know, of having the CIA cooperate with the mob to kill JFK. Like, it's like that. Right. Um. That, that's, that's quite a mainstream <laughs> American opinion, though, isn't it? Is that not like probably the majority of Americans think something like that is true? The, 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 uh, the majority of Americans believe in some in some sort of JFK conspiracy, including myself until I was, you know, a little older. I kind of actually still believe in one, but it's it's one of incompetence. <laughs> but you can talk about that another day. Um, my, my, my theory is in actually responding to the shot uh, by... Um, that they killed him, they shot him uh, three times they, in the they, head. Yeah, that the uh, that the Secret Service accidentally shot him in the head. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, I like that one. I like that one, Derek. That's <laughs> like, like that actually <laughs> to me that explains the most. But um, so uh, my, my theory was that he was chewing some of that, you know, like like uh, popping corn, and it like it was way way too strong and it <laughs> exploded his head. But that's again, you know, that's not a mainstream one. I must admit. Um, you know, so it's, it's hard to know, um, you know, man, it, it's, this is eerie though, to me, because one of the things I think Marx is doing here is, um, I think Marx is actually having a backdoor argument with other leftists with this set, with this section. Um, because the debates in the first international, like resolve, you know, are around so many of these classes that he's accusing Napoleon of using that I'm thinking like, you know, even though this is before that, that this was, uh, he was worried about this from like moment one for like discussions in the league of the just and the communist league that he was worried about the left trying to use these elements themselves and to align with, uh, with someone like Bismarck which he, you know, was turned out to be true to kind of take power and how bad that would go. Uh, there was a comment in chat that uh, CIA, uh, the, the CIA used the mafia to control Italy. I should also add that um, the current ruling party 
uh, in Japan, the long-time ruling party, the LDP, uh, was partially formed out of the uh, out of Japanese organized crime. Uh, it was a a sort of uh, coalition that was set up by the Americans uh, between organized criminals and uh, uh, sort of rump conservatives uh, who had who had been, were left over from the pre war period. Uh, so. Yeah, it was a kind of a standard practice uh, in, in that imperial way that uh, I think you were describing, Derek. Yeah, I mean, I, I was also thinking of of the pre's in Mexico as the pre moved it drifted white word over time from its socialist origins, um, the the Party Revolution de Institucional uh, Mexico. Um, it also did that thing where it would kind of cut deals with cartel leaders and stuff like that. And like cartel leaders from Pablo Escobar on have, have done a good job of doing the Robin Hood thing. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure, you know, because, because uh, American intelligence money is always everywhere. <laughs> like, like it's one of those things where it, like the, I, I never think of the CIA as particularly competent. But when you when you do like, oh, this person's backed by the CIA, you're like, well, that's because the CIA seems to give money to everybody. Like they're always trying to buy influence and intelligence all the time from all sides. Um, but um, uh, so, yeah, I, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I, I would be interested to know the meta context for this, though, like. Um, what what specific debates that Marx is referring to out, that he's not mentioning directly in this like you know in this kind of post mortem that he's doing here? Because you always have to remember like Marx's public writings are polemics and they're often polemics aimed at other leftists and so like some of these some of these things have implications of debates that we often can't remember and don't know. Okay, fair enough. I am um, like uh, I'm going to give it a go at the next little section here. I'll give it a read. Okay, if everybody's happy to move on. Um, now that it happened by so, yeah, so this is just continuing on the text. Now that it happened by way of exception that people's representatives belonging to the party of order came under the cudgels of the Decemberists. Sorry, now it had happened by way of exception that people's representatives belonging to the party of order came under the cudgels of the Decemberists. Still more, Jan, still more, Jan, the police commissioner assigned to the National Assembly and charged with watching over its safety, acting on the deposition of a certain Allais, advised the permanent commission that a section of the Decemberists had decided to assassinate General Changarnier and Dupin, the president of the National Assembly, and had already designated the individuals who were to perpetrate the deed. One comprehends the terror of Monsieur Dupin. Um, a parliamentary inquiry into the society of December the 10th, that is, the profanation of the Bonapartist secret world, seemed inevitable. Just before the meeting of the National Assembly, Bonaparte providently disbanded his society, naturally only on paper, for in a detailed memoir at the end of 1851, police per prefect Carlier still sought in vain to move him to really break up the Decemberists. The society of December the 10th was to remain the private army of Bonaparte until he succeeded in transforming the public army into a society of December the 10th. Bonaparte had made the first, made the first attempt at this shortly after the adjournment of the National Assembly and precisely with the money just wrested from it. As a fatalist, he lived in the conviction that there are certain higher powers which man, and the soldier in particular, cannot withstand. Among these powers, he counts first and foremost cigars and champagne, cold poultry and garlic sausage. Accordingly, to begin with, he treats officers and non-commissioned officers in his Elysee apartments to cigars and champagne, cold poultry and garlic sausage. <laughs> On October 3rd, he repeats this manoeuvre with the mass of the tro troops at the Saint Ma Review, Saint Ma Review, and on, on, on and on October the tenth, the same maneuver on a still larger scale at the Sa Satori Army Parade. The uncle remembered the campaigns of Alexandria in Asia. The nephew, 
the triumphal marches of Bacchus in the same land. Alexander was a demigod, to be sure, but Bacchus was a god, and moreover, the tutelary deity of the Society of December 10th. Uh, you might just want to reread the start of the sentence with Alexander. Okay. The uncle, remember the campaigns of Alexander. Oh, I got it wrong, did I? The uncle... Uh, the the uncle the uncle remembered the campaigns of Alexander in Asia, the nephew the nephew the triumphal marches of Bacchus in the same land. Alexander was a demigod to be sure, but Bacchus was a god, and moreover the tutelary deity of the society of December the tenth. Bacchus is also my personal deity, but that's just you know. <laughs> we we know you follow the Roman traditions. <laughs> He's like cold poultry doesn't seem that good a day that good a a, a bribe nowadays, does it? Like here's some cold chicken, lads. <laughs> have, have you ever have you ever watched Survivor, Tom? You know when they, when they get that 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 congratulatory victory food it's always cold like cold spaghetti cold meat you know what you know if i'm right about the stock market we might all be liking cold chicken pretty well um yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um you know what I, I i'm actually laughing at all the food references because i'm reading war minister hot hot pool hot pool how do you say that um Kyle? Hot pool. Hot hot pool. Pool. And I read it. I read it as hot pot. Hot pot. <laughs> general, general hot pot. General <laughs> hot pot and the cold pearl poultry. Yeah. Uh. Um, yeah. What do you guys? You know, I. You know, what's interesting to me about this is like this does seem like the kind of shenanigans. Um. <laughs> um sorry, <laughs> man. You guys, inter-European. Um, Bashing is so amusing to me. Uh, anyway, um, that that you don't see as much of this in in like the fully developed bourgeois states, but you definitely see it on like the periphery of bourgeois states, and that I guess that kind of makes sense. Like comparing France to England, you know, because England probably was wouldn't have done this in the same way. They didn't get up to these shenanigans. What do you what do you guys make of that? Like. What do you make of that in its developmental context? Because I really do have a hard time of like imagining the executive personally using them, although maybe not. I mean, we are talking about Trump times, but like in the height of American power, imagining the executive, the president alone without party apparatus or CIA or the OSS or anything directly using the mob you know, under the auspices of charity to get stuff done. But I definitely have seen that stuff in developing countries. Yeah, I mean, in India, the, uh, there's been, I think, more suggestion than reality, but definitely this strong connection between Modi and sort of far-right Hindu mobs. Um, but I don't know if it's that, I, I'm, I'm really, I don't think in that case it's as direct. As well, yeah, but the, I mean, but he, the thing is with Modi that you have a political tradition that he's coming out of with the with the Hindu Vadas that you know is kind of explicit, even if he's not doing it himself. Right. Um, but, and, yeah, but it, but it has a similar kind of like anti-political structure um, to to the kind of thing Bonaparte's pulling. So. Are we viewing anti-politics as when, like, when we let the lumpen go wild? Is that what it is? Like, is anti-politics lumpen go crazy time? Like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, not, not, I, I don't know if I'd be, like, but I guess there are definitely elements of that here, right? Like, so in the previous, in a few passages ago, when he was taught, when uh, Marx was talking about Bonaparte as transitioning from treating world history as, co uh, you know, as comedy to, putting his own comedy onto world history. Like that sounded like a very kind of like, you know, um, lumpen as degeneration of anti-politics kind of analysis. Yeah, I don't think uh, the lumpen uh, running amok is exhaustive of what anti-politics would mean. Clearly when like, if you look at like American developmental periods at the same time, 
Um, I mean, at the same, not the same time, the same developmental periods, like, uh, like the end of industrialization in the U.S., you clearly did have, like, like local and even federal governments hiring the mob and Pinkertons and who, whatever mercenaries they could from ever, from whatever campaign, like ex union and Confederate soldiers to go in and just mow people down. I mean, and it's even like preserved in our pop culture. Like if you go watch Westerns, that's like the implications of a lot of that stuff is, you know, yeah. we moved out West to get away from these fucking Pinkertons who like mowed down our mining town. And now they're Now these werewolf barons are coming for our lands and, we got to go fight them a la Shane. And, and like, yeah, so you, I mean, you see that in the United States and that happens actually after, I mean, it would be after France and that would make sense, right? Like you'll get your three oldest bourgeois republics. Um, like we're the third, well, we're, we're technically older than France, but we were not as developed. Um, so we're the third and, you know, we go through the period slightly later and you definitely like, if, God, read all the crazy shit that politicians were up to in the States from like 1850 to like 1930. It's, it's pretty wild. But would, it, uh, would you, would you think it's like, it seems to me like, is it a, is it a function of like the, like the, the state not being fully formed? You yeah. Know, that, that, that he can do it. But also it's like, if you think about it, like he's, you know, his uncle was the goddamn emperor and he probably had, untold amounts of money to just like throw around and well, he's, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he no. if he, if he saw that and no, no. He the money from the, one of the funny things is Marx points out he got the money from his ridiculously absorbent salary like yeah 600,000 francs in 1700s money is insane like oh, I, I, I know that but I, the president that now in the United States like uh, <laughs> Like, you know, I remember when the president, I think in, in the Clinton years, the president I think got paid 200, 250K and I think now it's at like six, 6,000K a year or something. But it's not, it's actually remarkably not high. Um, and I think part of the reason why is that, like, you, you don't want them using their salary for that. But yeah, I mean, he probably got up to all kinds of shit. But he's also, like, he's more of a disgrace, I mean, he's from a disgraced lineage who's trying to, like, make good. I mean, the most dangerous aristocrats are the ones that, kind of barely are, you know, like, like you look at who makes up conquistadors, you look at all this like end of feudal era shit, like those people are dangerous, <laughs> like, cause they're desperate. Um, and so, yeah, it's, but you know, I'm also trying to be a good Marxist and look at the like economic development. It's not just that the state's weak. It's that you still have like all these, you have a lot more auxiliary classes in these early stages of bourgeois development. And like, one of the funny things is, you know, you were reading that list of people that are in the, in that coalition and you, you like a knife grinder. What's wrong with being a knife grinder? Well, when I was on Egypt, like in 2000 and, and uh, 15, 2016, 2017, um, there were knife grinders everywhere. They were beggars. And apparently they were used, like a lot of the locals would accuse them of like being spies for the government because they were cheap. Like, I don't doubt it. Like, you know, like, you know, you, you meet this knife grinder and this kid and like, you know, and they're standing, they're standing in the road. Everybody just kind of ignores them. And, you know, it's not, it's not hard to, to cheapen them, to, to, to pay them off a little bit. And, you know, and also, you know, I, I don't want to lit them in the stereotypes, but it is a society that to survive, people actually kind of have to pay bribes because official salaries are so low, you can't survive off them. So, like, so, I mean, I'm, I also think that's probably true in France at the time. Like, so, you know, given that how many republics have we gone through by this point? Like, it's the fourth. It's, yeah. So it's, that normally doesn't breed a stable currency, for example. So... <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I, I, I would actually have to do like an economic history of France in the, in the 17th and 18th century to speak more, you know, authoritatively I, on this. I, I, I think as well, like if you like, you know, just re -re doing a capital reading group, you know, and you're going through all the madness that's going on in the 18th, in the 19th 
uh, sorry, the 1800s in England, where you know, you know, suddenly like the sewing machine comes in, bang, everybody doing their handicrafts at home are all screwed. And I can imagine the same kind of of, of creation of a mass uh, unemployed base is happening at the same time in France, it, it, not to the it, same it, extent, but one. It card. will. It will happen under Bonaparte, but it really hasn't kicked off yet in France. Uh, at this point, I mean, this um, is this is the puzzle, right? Like so many people talk about, uh, French industrialization is much much slower than British industrialization, German industrialization. Yeah, it, 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 it's something that only begins uh, in the in the Second Empire, uh, really. Was the German one not also slower? No, the German was fast because, but the the reason for that it is properly given by materialist liberal historians is that Germany didn't have enough of an empire to do shit with and so had to be more efficient to compete. So it, it, that efficiency against competing with European empires led it to like basically be like the engineer state and the state of poets and philosophers and to like really invest in its education system. Like the modern education system that all the, like the, all the world uses I mean, and France was still using this education system until the fucking 60s. It um, was basically a medieval clerical, you know, universities and schooling systems. And, like, the Prussians were like, nah, man, we got to modernize this shit. Like, and that's what the German and American school systems are founded on. And the UK is, too, to some degree, actually. The, those reforms, like the grade levels, the end of the 1-1 one, one schoolhouse, um, the testing regimes, those all come out of, pro of like, Prussian efficiency moves try to outcompete the British. Um, well, I'm telling you, I did a maths degree in the 90s in Ireland, and it was like fucking Jesuits. They used to get us to do to learn theorem and proof off by heart. So you would have maybe in a course you might have 80 theorems and proofs, and what you your your exam would literally be going and just like state this theorem, prove it, and you'd have to know about 80 theorems, and it's just like. You they never asked you to do a, to do any math. It was just like rote learning. Fucking incredible. That's pretty. That's pretty amazing. Um, but not surprising because Ireland's pretty. I mean, one of the things that I, I uh, Amog might remember this. Amog asked me to talk about the forms of education worldwide. Like, God, this was like six years ago. We this did, was the very first thing, thing we did, I think. Yeah, this massive six-hour podcast. <laughs> like, we'll be going through the entire history of Western education. Um, which is something I actually know probably better than this stuff. And um, one of the things I pointed out is like Latin America is kind of weird because it's still kind of based on that like medieval model of education systems because it's, of Catholic influence and all that. It's also which, re the reason why you see like the people in the Vienna circle uh, and that grouping be so radical is because they were incredibly frustrated with the Catholic system that was still in place and how conservative and and, and out, out of date it was so uh, to me that's just an epiphenomena of like germans not having an empire so they had to industrialize really fast but kind of like china and russia did they also had the advantage of of like the english-speaking world and its colonies having already done so so all they had to do was improve in advance um, and so you can, like, if you have, again, liberal materialists more than Marxists study this, but if you look at, like, these societies, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit at first, and then this new society comes on, and they just steal all the innovation of the prior society, like, the United States did it to Britain, and China's doing it to everybody, um, and they improve on it immediately, because the research R&D that they have can be invested on advancement, more than coming up with it in the first place. Um, and so, you know, and, and so like, it, it makes sense to me that like, that, uh, that Germany was able to do it so much faster. The UK kind of pioneered it, but it had all those imperial resources to really propel it. But France was, you know, kind of a cluster mess. Um, and, I mean, really, it's strange to think of because of the Napoleonic army, but if you look at it economically, it was kind of a developing country compared to 
um, compared to England at the time. It just, yeah. it just had all those numbers, didn't it? It had a very big population. It had like double the British population, I think, at the time, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, and also... Triple. Actually, triple. It was 30 million or something crazy. Right. But also, if you think about that, too, like, when you have that much labor power, you can be inefficient as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, so... What do you call it? Uh, uh, there was a guy in my in my maths uh, course, and he his name was Anto, and he was a real big tough guy. He was the he was the captain of the Gaelic football team in, in Trinity, and he was he was a total tank of a guy. But he used to go to no lectures, and he would just like he would get notes from people. But he had an amazing memory, so he would just learn all this stuff off by heart, and he had no understanding what any of the symbols or anything meant. And in one of his courses, he had, he had lost one of the page one of the pages in this big long proof with these seminal like complex analysis proofs. It was like six foods cap kind of a proof, and he missed out two of them. And he basically wrote out the proof perfectly, but he, he had memorized it without this one sheet, so none of it made any sense. And uh, they copped on what he was doing, and they failed him for the entire year. But how could you possibly just learn all the symbols with no meaning? Fucking hell, man. I mean, just to, just to give some context, like in 1831, like half the labor force is in agriculture, you know. So that's uh, that's what really is it? What, what would it be a mog at the time in, in the UK? Would it be uh, something similar? I think it's less, uh, definitely less. I think this is, yeah, 23%. I think that the figure I was looking at is 23% of the population um, in the UK compared to like 50 in France. Um, so it's, it's you know, I'm actually like a lot of the a few Sweden and a number of other countries like this is this is a this is a general pattern like France is but France is an outlier because it has this massive population and it's you know um, all kinds of other things but it's like as yeah, yeah, Derek was saying it's a developing country in that it had respect. it had a lot of garlic sausage um, <laughs> and Moog, how do you feel about reading this next chapter next, sure. next bit? Sure. So this is after the review. Is that yeah, right? after review down to the, to the little quote where they do the work. Okay. Um, after the review of October the 3rd, the permanent commission summoned War Minister Otpul. Uh, he promised that these breaches of discipline would not recur. We know how on October the 10th, Bonaparte kept Otpul's word. As commander in chief of the Paris army, Shanganier had commanded at both reviews, at once a member of the permanent commission, chief of the National Guard, that, quote, saviour, unquote, of January 29th and June 13th, the bulwark of society, the candidate of the party of order for presidential honours, the suspected monk of two monarchies. He had hitherto never acknowledged himself as the subordinate of the war minister, had openly derided, had always openly derided the Republican constitution, and had pursued Bonaparte with an ambiguous lordly protection. Now he was consumed with zeal for discipline against the war minister and for the constitution against Bonaparte. While on October the 10th, a section of the cavalry raised the shout, vive Napoleon, vive les saucissons, hurrah for Napoleon, hurrah for the sausages. Changanier arranged that at least the infantry marching past the command of his friend Neumeyer should preserve an icy silence. As a punishment, the war minister relieved General Neumeyer of his post in Paris at Bonaparte's instigation on the pretext of appointing him commanding general of the 14th and 15th division. Neumeyer refused this exchange of posts and so, so had to resign. Changanier, for his part, published an order of the day on November the 2nd in which he forbade the troops to indulge in political outcries or demonstrations of any kind while under arms. The Elysee newspapers attacked Changanier the papers of the Party of Order attacked Bonaparte. The Permanent Commission ha held repeated secret sessions in which it was repeatedly proposed to declare the country in danger. The army seemed divided into two hostile camps with two hostile general staffs, one in the Elysee, where Bonaparte resided, the other in the Tuileries, the quarters of Changanier. It seemed that the only, only the meeting of the National Assembly was needed to give the signal for battle. The French public judged this friction between Bonaparte and Changanier like the English journalist who characterized it in these words. The political housemaids of France are sweeping away the glowing lava of the revolution with old brooms and wrangle with one another as they do, while they do their work. I find this paragraph a little bit eerie at the moment to what's going on in America. What do people think? Yeah, we were talking about those army splits, weren't we? 
Um, except, except you get the sense that there's, <laughs> in it's some ways, less gridlock. But <laughs> I'll leave it to other people to judge. I, I, I think, I think, um, basically, if Trump had been smarter with the military, the way he had had people address him with the judiciary, because Trump took other people's orders on the judiciary and just stacked it appropriately. Um, I mean, appropriately for him and his conservative allies and uh, the American Heritage I mean, the Heritage Foundation and et cetera. Um, you, I think you'd see something like that. But Trump did not learn the first rule of Cadilloism, and that is make sure the military is loyal first. And he doesn't come from their ranks. And in the United States, the military has been able to kind of – I mean, it's been used as a political football, but – no one really uses generals that way and attempts to do so after Eisenhower have largely failed. I, you know, I've, I've talked about James Burnham before, but that's one of the prediction he makes where he's utterly wrong. Um, where he predicts that like we'd have Bonapartist tendencies with generals in the U S becoming presidents. Um, and, um, that exposes the apparatus to public, to public scrutiny too much, but it is interesting how it's pretty clear that like Trump did it sound like he kind of wanted to attempt something like this, but had no idea like where to get his generals from. All he could That's really, right. All he could really do is play with the civilian oversight of the of the military, not the military itself. Yeah, he he didn't have his faction in the Pentagon, or if they existed, he didn't organize them well enough. Uh, so I, I yeah, I just I. I don't really see this uh, split uh, military phenomenon uh, playing out right now. Uh, it, it, it's there's no clear spokesperson for the Trumpist side. But what it, what I will say is he 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 overestimated the civilian apparatus of the military. So like he thought like by having blowhards like Pompeo and formerly having like people like John Kelly on chief of staff, he'd have some of these people on his side, but Kelly was on the side of the military, clearly. Like, that's it what seems, it, yeah. It, it seems nearly like it was a battle he never kind of expected to have to have, you know, that this thing just blew up in his face and then he just went, oh, I'm the man in charge. I can boss people around without knowing, like not, not even thinking about the politics of the army. Well, being a tin pot real estate man does not does not prepare you to be a tin pot dictator, Tom. Like that's those are different skill sets. They're different tin pots. You need to no, 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 no. They're exactly the same, Derek. Exactly the same. <laughs> um, uh, any 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 uh, discussion on this paragraph in and of itself? It seems like that uh, he's been. Um, He's managed to kind of put Shangarnier under the command of the war minister, where Shangarnier seemed to be kind of like uh, an opposing kind of totem in political life. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like when MacArthur was running rampant in Asia and, you know, there was no one really telling him what to do. Uh, and he sort of threatened to... Uh, uh, overcome the uh, civilian apparatus. Um, that's kind of the position Sean Garnier was in, but then he's kind of been put in on the defensive here. And like, uh, the, was Bonaparte? A, I don't think uh, Bonaparte had been a successful military leader beforehand, right? Because one of the things that no, was, he he led these these harebrained uh, revolutionary expectations. Uh, that all, that you know, he tried to seize power, and they were just catastrophic failures. Right, like it, it was mentioned in one of the previous paragraphs you read, where he said it landed with a load of English people. Do you remember he said that? That that's what that was about. Where he landed with some like English, um, some French guys in England, who who believed him that this when he said, "Oh, we can invade and we'll we'll take over." I mean, it sounded like 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 one of those weird Wonka coups and. And, you know, with, like, British aristocrats trying to go back and take over, like, Sierra Leone or something. Like, you know, and getting mm. their ass handed to them by the Zimbabwean police. 
Like, yeah, like <laughs> yeah it, it, it was it was like that uh, weird uh, Mar- Mar- mercenary coup attempt in Venezuela that happened recently. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or Mark Thatcher. Do you remember like uh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Mark Thatcher in, in Guinea, New Guinea, or or not um, Guinea Bissau, I think. Here, here's a line in that one. He says, "For his for his eruption into Boulogne, he put some London lackeys in French uniforms." That's that's what he's talking about there in that previous paragraph. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I could see Trump doing that, except that Trump doesn't come from, he doesn't think, Trump does not think militarily, actually, and kind of, sometimes I'm grateful for it, (laughs) to be frank, like, like, he, he kind of approaches everything as a blowhard fake boss on TV, so, yeah, every power problem is basically a media problem of one kind or another, right? Yeah, he, he it's all PR. I, but it, he's also kind of you know boardroom scheme, boardroom scheming, is you know as opposed to thinking about like the forces of power in a society, right? Which uh, you know, which is why I think the the our party of order hates him so much. But still, um, like if Trump had ever been a CEO of a large production company that had to deal with established unions he would be a different kettle of fish altogether yeah or if he came from like Lockheed Martin he'd be a different kettle I mean like like if you think about like it's not that for example like the Bush administration was less corporate they just came out of the corporate sectors adjacent to a geopolitical conflict like Halliburton yeah I mean, there's also, like, if you think about all of Trump's, like, shitty deals and the way he, you know, it's all all of the stuff was so, it's all a lot of of legalistic stuff, you know, trying to get tenants evicted and trying to, you know, it's all kind of rentier. It's none of this. It's it's certainly not industrial conflict. And it's certainly not, you know, as people were saying, it's not like mobilizing a force um, of any kind. It's all kind of either media fuckery or kind of, you know, landlord fuckery. <laughs> yeah, media fuckery, IP fuckery are, um, are are basic landlordism, which totally makes sense, right? That's what he did. I mean, he was also bad at it. So... Um, yeah, his success came when he actually, like, got into showbiz. Um, and, and I guess that's the intuition he's followed. So, I mean... It's interesting to think about like what Bonapartism looks like at different stages of the economy, since we are kind of in the United States is clearly more in a rentier economy. Um, but also, like it means that, frankly, if you take that view, it makes our Bonapartes even like even more farcical because they they can't even control the military. Like, you know, <laughs> like that's the one thing Bonapartists are supposed to do. I mean, if you like, uh, yeah, no, it's uh, they, it's not clear they can really control anything except the, the sort of media space in which, uh, you know, elections and elite discourse takes place. Yeah. And I think I think that's true for both in, in, in England as well. I think it shows that are like our political class. It's like they're operating purely on political logic. You know, they don't have any competency or any of these things. You see again and again here with the COVID response, both in the UK and in America, it's like they purely just have, they just operate on this day-to-day political ideas, nothing to do with competency or anything. It's kind of, it's staggering. You mean when you say political, you mean like keeping poll numbers up and that playing to the base, that kind of thing? Yeah, like a PR logic. You know, like it's like they're all being run by marketing agencies. I mean, right. that's, how the, that's how the economic deliberation takes place as well, right? Like, so the, you know, it's like uh, in the Tory party, it's like, you know, um, there's rural interests who make a big scene and, you know, some Tory ministers get annoyed and that gets input into the trade deal. Or, you know, there are, there are some other members of the base that make noise and the, the government has to do something to pacify them. It's all this kind of whack-a-mole media exercise, even at the level of policy. It's enough to make me kind of believe in left-com degeneration theory. I know that. Like, mm. 
Well, it, it, it yeah. it's like, have you seen uh, Avenue 5, the, the new show with Hugh Lowry in it? No. Nope. No. So, uh, well, he, he like plays the captain of the starship and uh, he's hired on uh, because the person who is actually supposed to run the ship doesn't have any charisma. So he hires an actor to play the captain who has a actually no abilities and captaincy except for PR. And then they get into a, a serious crisis and the, the, the person who is supposed to run the ship is dead and the actor is left in charge. And that very much feels like where we are with like American and British politics right now. <laughs> is this he, like a does he prove to be surprisingly good in kicking the can down the road? No, it's just an ongoing disaster. <laughs> uh, uh... <laughs> well, you know what? You know what's funny about that to me though. This trend in American politics is not new. It's just gotten like farcical. Um, and what I mean by that is like. Reagan. Reagan. Reagan, Reagan, Reagan. But Reagan. at least Reagan did have a stint in government, you know, before becoming the actor president. Like, there was mm -hmm. at least a tacit, I mean, again, this is the first strategy to the sparse thing. There was at least a tacit, like, I have to learn these skills. I'm going to run for governor of California. You know, I dealt, I was part of, and then against the actors union. Um, you know, I've done political things before. You know, whereas in the test, in the case of Trump, Trump's sojourn into politics has just been PR and donations um, until you know until basically two thousand and what ten. Let's, really, let's not, let's not forget his wrestling. He was very good at the wrestling. <laughs> but but it, it tells you how much. Yeah, I mean, like the truth to the anti political discourse. But the the thing you know that my complaint about the anti political discourse has always been is it ignores the economic realities of the situation. And one of the things that we have to look at in the United States is like the development and to, I, I, God, it's funny because Tyler Cohen sounds like a Marxist when he talks about this, right? You guys know that economist, right? No, like, who's that? Who's that? No. The American libertarian is like, he's like, we're going to have the profit declines because low hanging fruit is over. There's no easy technological developments to expand commodity production easily. There's no there's not a whole lot of markets to grow into, um, you know, and so you're going to see an increase and in, uh, focus on the state. And I was haunted by this because I was also reading um, Wayne Price. I was reading it for this podcast because he writes, he thinks Marx's theory of the class nature of the state had changed in Brumaire. And I think he's wrong. But one of the things that he says is that, uh, in the Grundessa, Marx posits kind of offhand that as capitalists, re as the, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall reaches a pro reaches a high point, capitalists will start relying on the rentier tactics to get profitability back up. And to do that, they will need an ever uh, stronger state. Because rentiers only work when you have police to enforce property values, particularly on abstract things like intellectual property. Right. So... So like that that like threw me for a loop because I was reading that and then reading Tyler Cohen at the same time and but the important you know, thing Derek is like that it redistributes they can only redistribute profits they can't generate new profits correct you you're right but that well but Mar Marx predicts that that leads to like like severe decline it leads into it leads into a kind of like it could lead into a like a semi permanent state of decline um, if the proletariat doesn't seize power, like, and the yeah, proletariat yeah, would have usually yeah. lose the ability to because their production is less and less important. So that's haunted. I mean, he doesn't say that, but that is like a logical implication of, of some of his other ideas. I'm not going to, I shouldn't say that Marx says that, but like that the idea that the rentier state becomes more and more important and um, certainly in uh, in inter international trade, you know, specifically, like I think if you, I think I saw some analysis of how the surplus is controlled for that's generated in in China, and mm -hmm. it's really amazing. Like who controls the shipping, who controls the the legal entities of the, on the IP, and where all the surplus is going. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's 
it's fucking phenomenal how little of it China is actually managing to grab. I mean, so I, I am actually like sort of um, I'm amazed at and I, you know, we're going to be living in a time where the Romero is going to feel particularly haunting, I think, because we're about to be in a real global economic crisis in a way that we've maybe never seen. Because one of the things that um, that I was reading that terrifies me is they're predicting recession in the developing economies, which have never had them. Like, this is like the business cycle hits everywhere at once. And right. Yeah. Like, China will not be able to, like, Keynesianism its way out of this situation. Right. And thus also the United States won't be able to either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because consumption, everybody's consumption, if you're sitting in your gaff, your consumption has to go down. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and, you, and you also can't use another state to offload your excess production, which is how we've been had, hiding this for so long. Like, China can't offload its excess production to, you know, U.S. toy markets or Amazon anymore. Like, the overproduction problem becomes universal, not just for one country to deal with. It, but a lot of it probably depends, I, you know, it, which sectors get hit, I think, as in what the effect will be. Because um, you could, you know, like the actual productive economy is not being hit as hard as a service economy. So that'll make a big difference from station yes. to nation. Like you look at the, the service was... economy in, 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 in London here. It's just been absolutely destroyed. But the service economy gets it first. Then that causes reverberations in the housing market. When the housing market fails, you have a, you have massive capital devaluation. With massive capital devaluation, then you have the inability to invest. When you have the inability yeah. to invest, then you have actual commodity production problems. Like it's 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 not a matter of it's not a matter of like one sector can falter, but one sector faltering everywhere will affect every other sector everywhere in a way that almost ensures um crisis i don't i don't really like and, well, and like, our planners have been have been shockingly bad at at predicting how their own system works even like it's like so for example one of the reasons why everybody was predicting a quick recovery um was that in april you saw the largest increase in american household income um ever from negative 2% to 10% higher. But you know why? The the $600 addition in the 12. Yeah, the $1200 check. It was it was the it was the <laughs> like it was like the only downward distribution of wealth in like the last 40 years. Right, but it was also right after the the biggest upward distribution of wealth yeah. ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I mean I mean yeah, like it's it's like a, a an outlier in a trend that is utterly the opposite direction. Right. But that's going to end in July. So they were predicting, I mean, the fucking economic analysis people were being so stupid as to predict the, the, uh, the spike. That's ridiculous. That's the so spike. It's, it's, it's completely ridiculous. But the, the, uh, the, the spike in April from from a temporary government assistance program was somehow going to float the entire economy into an immediate uplift without <laughs> realizing that the way, they, the way they've timed this, <laughs> that um, that literally that mar um, mortgage mortgage uh, rental um, all those protections, the unemployment. That will all stop way before employment fully returns, and and also the eviction protections and all that are going to go flat. And a little bit. This is something I was shocked about that I was talking about the CDLs earlier. Like collateralized debt things were relegalized in the Trump era in a slightly yeah. different way. And so, like that thing that brought the economy down in two thousand seven. Yeah. It's trying to explode in September. But it's even it's worse though, because these are uh these are mainly the big market is in CLOs, which is in uh, corporate right. debt. And the corporate debt tranches are like so like the ones that are triple A of them are still fucking corporate debt that can't issue their own bonds. 
So right. it's like that stuff is going to go from probably worth triple A ratings to maybe, you know, like in, in this in this scenario, like these firms could actually go bust. It could go to like 10 cents on the dollar, you know, any like certainly the lower end of the those tranches and those things. But even the other ones might get screwed beyond belief. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the people are right, by the way, uh, people in the chat are right, that while this is happening, we're not even factoring in the fact that, like, the 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 state level, because unemployment's run state to state, the state level um, red tape on getting unemployment is still massive in a lot of states. And so like, I think it's like maybe, I've, I've read between a third, only a third or a half, depending on who you read, of the claims have even been honored. So, like... Fuck, man. Like, and so, yeah, when I read this, I'm just thinking, like, maybe France and, you know, Louis Napoleon, that normally I think of those times as, like, some of the worst times to have been a worker. But, like, I don't know. Like, we might be nostalgia for it. We might have nostalgia for them soon. I, like, I mean, there's also one thing people haven't figured out is the whole, like, what if everyone was blaming everything on lockdown? And I feel like that was quite a lot of the reasons for, for optimism, that the thought was when states do their reopening things, people are just going to resume the behavior that they had. Yeah, you know? but that wasn't true in South Korea or in Sweden. Like we, our Swedish compatriots are here, but like, like they had service sector problems too without the lockdown. Because people don't go out when you fucking has a chance to kill grandmother. Like they just don't. <laughs> <laughs> like... And everywhere, even, irrational. <laughs> even in the UK and the US, like people were taking uh, quarantine measures way before the government did ever did anything. Yeah, right. it was. It came from the people in the UK. The government was forced by pretty much political, not like it was by public pressure that they gave into it. Yeah, um, it was similar here, actually. I, like, it, it was a state level public pressure. Trump only started weighing into it. Really, it late. does. It does depend though on what type of granny you have, though, Derek. That's what you you gotta. You gotta admit that. Well, I mean, uh, like, I, I have a story about that, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, to be completely fair, I think we've all decided that there's something worth sacrificing Granny for now, and it's not just the economy, but like it's the communist revolution, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but but I mean, let's not go there. Yeah, I mean, but when, when you look at the one of the things this Bromare is bringing is bringing up to me though is like what happens in a time of, of real capitalist chaos when the capitalists can't lead. And so whatever faction can rise up will. And uh, this is what Wayne Price was saying. Wayne Price said that um, Marx was leaning towards the Lasallian and social democratic view around the Brumaire, that the state was not a truly class organ, or he was at least struggling with it because of the rise of Louis Napoleon in his suppression of the uh, bourgeois elements um, and the bourgeois elements own um, reversion to prior norms. Um, you know, they basically undid everything they promised. Um, I don't think that's true. Like, I don't think Marx gave up on the class notion of the state, but it is interesting that in these periods of chaos where the bourgeoisie really don't seem to be in control, you, uh, like you don't have the right kind of bourgeoisie for control, right? Like they just, they're PR men, they're salesmen, they're service sector people. They're not people who've had to manage masses of people in a, that kind of way and produce something and have that kind of. Derek, like, your, 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 your mic is breaking up. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But like one thing I would say, Derek, there is like that. Like, I do not think like that the bourgeoisie would have support. Let me just, I'm going to mute you for a second. I, I don't think the bourgeoisie would have allowed or been as complacent about like a radical leftist, if that's what Bonaparte was. You know, it's only that, you know, he was a kind of bit of a schemer, but he wasn't interested in in upending the system. That like this this idea for whichever is organized, it, 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 it tracks right. And remember that Bonaparte still has finance behind him at this point. The financiers are behind Bonaparte. Yeah, we're going to get onto that in a while. He gets his his, his financier uh, is a fauché into the into his um, into his cabinet by the end of this chapter. Will so, we keep... yeah, can you hear me better now, Tom? Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things that's interesting to me is finance is not siding with Trump. 
Um, so to talking to this, so that's another difference. Like finance, it, what, what about the UK? How is Johnson siding with finance? Oh, finances essentially doesn't mind him. Like they didn't like Brexit, finance didn't. But once it happened, they kind of got over it fairly quickly. So now they're totally fine with the Tories. Well, I, ha I have the feeling that like in the United States, finance is split between, I mean, they're basically happy with either side as long as they think they can control them and they effectively can. I mean, look at who they always stock, but that's the sector of our economy that does like tends to cozy up to the executive the most is uh, finance. Um, and that's even true for the left wing economy too. I mean, like not the radical left, but the center left. I mean, like finance kind of likes MMT, I think. Yeah, there's all these, you know, Ray Dalio and all these fuckers coming out with uh, stuff about how government spending, government deficit spending is good. Um, and Soros is, you know, a major funder of MMT economics and obviously comes from finance. Is he? Uh, I, yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's, yeah. he's like uh, got a whole institute uh, that he's, he's, he's funding. It's like one of the it's one of the few places where you can get funding if you're a heterodox economist. Oh, this is oh, that's right. It's Inesh Institute for New Economic Thinking. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, they are very post Keynesian friendly. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. If if you're if you're heterodox or mostly post Keynesian, then that's where you're going to get your money. Yeah. Well, all I'm saying is that like I had Stephanie Kelton on as a guest way back in like. I don't know, 2013 or something. If Bernie had got in, I would have had an in with the Treasury Secretary. Lads, the podcast numbers could have been flying. It could have been what drove the communist revolution. Not these wishy-washy protests on the street, but that interview with Stephanie Kelton. Yeah, so but, so um, leftist grift as revolution returns in the Bernie bros of the world. Is that what lives on in our heart? Oh, yeah, baby. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. I'm telling you, the grift, the grift has been on show the last couple of weeks. Something wicked. Um, uh, let's let's move it on. Will we move on to these? Uh, uh, I'll read a couple of these paragraphs. Um, or Derek, do you want to have a go at these? Can you see them ones? Yeah, I can see them. Uh, wait, which ones are we at? Uh, the the bird Meanwhile. Bird. Meanwhile, okay. Bonaparte, yeah, down to the St. Maur and Satori. Ah, uh, yes, good. There's less French in this. Um, meanwhile, Bonaparte hastened to remove the war minister, Hapud, to pull him off in all haste to Algiers and to appoint General Scram, war minister in his place. On November 12th, he sent to the National Assembly a message of, the, of American prolexy, overloaded with detail, wrote, redolent of order, desirous of reconciliation, constitutionally acquiescent, treating of all and sundry, but not of the questions of the, the questions, uh, brulantes, the burning questions of the moment. As if in passing, he made a remark that according to the express provisions of the constitution, the president alone could depose the army. The message closed with the following words with great solemnity. Above all things, France demands tranquility, but Bound by oath, I shall keep within the narrow limits that has been set for me. As far as I am concerned, elected by the people, owing my power to it alone, I shall bow to its lawfully expressed will. Should you resolve at this session on a revision of the Constitution, a constituent assembly will regulate the position of the executive power. If not, then the people will solemnly pronounce the decision in 1852. But whatever the solutions of the future may be, let us come to an understanding so that passion, surprise, or violence may never decide the destiny of this great nation, of a great nation. What occupies my attention, above all, is not who will rule France in 1852, but how to employ the time which remains at my disposal so that intervening period may pass by without agitation or disturbance. I have opened my heart to you with sincerity. You will have my answer. Uh, you will answer my frankness with your trust, my good endeavors with your cooperation and God will do the rest. The respectable, hip, um, hypocritically moderate, virtuous, commonplace language of the bourgeoisie reveals its deepest meaning in the mouth of an autocrat of the Society of December 10th and the picnic hero of saint Mar and Sartori. <laughs> Which is funny, right? Because I, I get the feeling that if Trump talked like this, the Democrats would actually kind of like him. Oh, they'd love him. They'd be like, oh, he's a great, he's, he's presidential. Um, 
Uh, this is this is hilarious, you know. He, Marks gets so much mileage out of that sausage, you know. It's it's amazing. I mean, this is the thing. This is the thing about like appeals to stability in an unstable time, right? It's like you know, it's crazily hostage to fortune as to like you know which force has the ability to actually make that appeal concrete, right? So the Democrats can say all that they want that you know we just want to get back to normal. But the precise point at this moment is that, like, we don't know what normal is. And so, any, <laughs> you know, anyone can make speeches like this. Yeah, and I mean, also, normal isn't very popular at this moment. <laughs> so, Kyle, we bring back to the 18th premiere of Joe Biden. <laughs> Yeah, Biden is very much speaking in the way that uh, Louis Napoleon is speaking in, the, in, in that passage. Uh, <laughs> you know, Biden would be like, "Listen here, Jack. <laughs> I once knew a guy called uh, I don't know Bull Pimple, and he was a tough guy." <laughs> oh man, fucking Joe Biden! Shoot him in the leg, Joe Biden. Um, okay. So what does it mean here, but not have the question Brillantes? That wh what's he saying that he's uh, ignoring here? Well, he's ignoring the question of like the actual power struggle, right? Like the point about this stuff about tranquility is that it's like passing over the conflict between him and Sean Garnier and all the all this all the stuff that Marx is talking about in the previous passages. Right. If Trump had a if Trump had a be, be like a, a nice wordy gentleman, would the army have gone on the streets? Mm. It would never get to there anyway, so it's kind of a dumb question. But like, uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. But the, the, the thing is, if Trump had been that, and also thought more about the army's makeup and whatever, he probably would not. He probably would have found a way to have the army intervene without directly intervening, which would have been the more likely outcome. Like the military could do some backdoor things. I mean, the, the other thing is. Is and I, I don't want to sound like I'm shitting on people. I don't think these protests are going to go away today or tomorrow, but like the 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 attention for them and the passion for them has already ebbed, and so like the military was probably right in 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 the side of order to just say, "Do sit on your hands," and it'll probably die down. Like, if nothing else, people are going to get sick. So you know. Like I, 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 that's the part of the military cynical equation. Like, uh, and I don't think the average soldier would have thought this. I just think like a lot of the average soldier now kind of wants to leave even more than they already did. Um, I think that, but the brass would probably just like you know, let's see what happens in three weeks. Maybe half of these people will be too sick to matter anyway. It's kind of baffling that in 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 this kind of real political crisis in America, they're not even not even paying any attention to what's going in the economy. They're not even like, they're not even pretending to do anything or give a shit. It's kind of, it's so baffling. I mean, like, what do people make of that? Like, they, like, they're not even holding sessions. Like you were saying, Derek, even if they wanted to do something now, it'd be difficult for them to pass stuff. They well, I the mean, the, the, the Democrats kind of are, but the Republicans are sitting on their hands, I think because they realize that there's a limit to what they can do in the international economy without affecting the national bond rating. And because that continued temporary measures aren't going to be enough. So why not have none? What's, what's What will be interesting about that in our time is um, the states that including in particular, the GOP states are going to have a hard time being loyal to the GOP Senate in this because they are fucked in a way that the, the feds are not. Um, and and so, like, I don't. What I don't understand is, is this like, have they have they bought their own Kool Aid? Or do they understand something that we don't get? I think the Democrats kind of do. That's why they've been talking out of their mouth, you know, and in, and in some ways, like disempowering the protests by at one point supporting them and encouraging broad scale support, even from like health ministers and well, health officials and shit. We don't have ministers. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and from, and at the same time, like being the leaders of the cities who were doing the suppression. And so just hoping that in that mixed messaging, it'll die down. And, um, I, I don't know that they're wrong. 
Um, but the the conflating factor is you're right. They're not they're not like they're not even looking at what the impending economic doom is going to do to all this. Like if you think things are bad now when people are bored, but but or at least still have housing. What happens when you have potentially a tenth for the American population become homeless overnight? Like. And I will add that uh, in Canada, uh, since last week, uh, the government has been cracking the whip. Um, they've been, the press and the government have both been going in hard uh, at, um, so previously the uh, emergency funding that was given to people um, to support them during the crisis uh, and the stay at home orders uh, was sort of framed as, uh, you know, take it out of an abundance of caution. Um, if you receive the money, the worst that's going to happen, like if you receive the money erroneously, the worst that's going to happen to you is you have to pay it back. And now they're talking about uh, very uh, high fines and imprisonment uh, for people who receive the, the money uh, incorrectly uh, or erroneously. Uh, so there's been a switch towards austerity discourse in the last week in Canada. I can't wait till Trudeau gives you the prison problem that we have in the United States. That would be so, that's such a lovely irony. <sighs> you know, we'll see what happens. I, I wrote I wrote a letter to him last week, an angry <laughs> letter to him. I Seriously. did. Yeah, I said it to him. Yeah, oh, yeah. For fuck's sake, you're a bigger crank than I am. That's not a crank thing. It's like he's threatening <laughs> to imprison my family. You know, that's that's like you know, you just an offhand thing you do. You go back on your word and threaten to imprison someone. Ah, uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, well, I'm kind of not writing a writing him a letter. Like I don't know. Uh, I, it's just blow it off steam, you know. I don't, ex <laughs> I don't expect that'll affect anything. But it's very yeah. Canadian of you to write a letter because you know what I would want to do. But <laughs> <laughs> my letter. wild west frontier Americanism's like, well, letter there's bombs. two ways. There's Fucking... two ways you handle this. <laughs> one of them does not end well for one party or another. Yeah. Ted Kaczynski, Ted Kaczynski over here is going to be mailing bombs, mailing <laughs> bombs. <laughs> <laughs> here's what i think about your lousy speech Boom. right okay we we'll do one final paragraph here before Random we bomb uh, is an american tradition tom what is what what's it what's in it random bombings are an american tradition tom oh that's true you don't need to talk about an irish fella about that now derek you're talking to the master here now uh okay let's um uh it, actually there was a Right where my house is in the middle of the country, there, there used to be a, a, an RIC barracks there, which is like a Royal Irish Constabulary. That was like the British uh, police uh, when they were in charge there. And a friend of mine's grandfather, uh, two friends of mine, both their grandfather blew it up in uh, in the War of Independence. And then one of my neighbours built their, built their house from the stones <laughs> of the old barracks. I always like that story. It's metal as hell. Isn't it? <laughs> I think they were only like 18 and they fucking blew it up. I don't know how the fuck they did it, uh, but they did it anyway. Um, uh, okay, uh, now, okay, so let me read this paragraph here. Uh, or Kyle, you go back, you go back to work with you, Kyle. You're, you, you get this final one to read. All right, all right. The Burgraves of the Party of Order did not delude themselves for a moment concerning the trust that this opening of the heart deserved. About oafs, they had long been blasé. They numbered in their midst veterans and virtuosos of political perjury. Nor had they failed to hear the passage about the army. They observed with annoyance that in its discursive enumeration of lately enacted laws, the message passed over the most important law, the electoral law, in studied silence. And moreover, in the event of there being no revision of the Constitution, left the election of the president in 1852 to the people. The electoral law was the lead ball chained to the feet of the party of order, which prevented it from walking and so much the more from storming forward. Moreover, 
by the official disbandment of the Society of December 10th and the dismissal of War Minister Outpul, Bonaparte had, with his own hand, sacrificed the scapegoats on the altar of the country. He had blunted the edge of the expected collision. Finally, the party of order itself anxiously sought to avoid, to mitigate, to gloss over any decisive conflict with the executive power. For fear of losing their conquests over the revolution, they allowed their rival to carry off the fruits thereof. Above all things, France demands tranquility. This was what the party of order had cried to the revolution since February 1848. This was what Bonaparte's message cried to the party of order. Above all things, France demands tranquility. Bonaparte committed acts that aimed at usurpation, but the party of order committed, quote unquote, unrest if it raised a row about these acts and construed them hypochondriacally. The sausages of Satori were quiet as mice when no one spoke of them. Above all things, France demands tranquility. Bonaparte demanded, therefore, that he be left in peace to do as he liked, and the parliamentary party was paralyzed by a double fear. The fear of again invoking, or sorry, evoking revolutionary unrest, and the fear of itself appearing as the instigator of unrest in the eyes of its own class, in the eyes of the bourgeoisie. Consequently, since France demanded tranquility above all things, the party of order dared not answer war after Bonaparte had talked peace in his message. The public, which had anticipated scenes of great scandal at the opening of the National Assembly, was cheated of its expectations. The opposition deputies who demanded the submission of the Permanent Commission's minutes on the October events were outvoted by the majority. On principle, all debates that might cause excitement were eschewed. The proceedings of the National Assembly during November and December 1850 were without interest. Okay, so he says, uh, Napoleon essentially blunted the battle of the, uh, the charges of the party of order by playing their own game against him. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he, like he, fi he forced them into basically backtracking away from looking at the, at the, uh, the commission on the, uh, uh, the permanent commission about the events of, uh, uh, he's talking here about the assassination attempts. So basically they've just completely folded in his, in, in to, to Napoleon's arguments. Sounds like, a, sounds like a line by line commentary on the Democrats. <laughs> he used the uh he used the obsession with order against the party of order exactly i mean as well as the there's the, the the moment in the middle where he talked about the elect emphasis on elections being the lead ball that prevented it from walking like that's uh <laughs> that's definitely that's definitely very apt certainly today you know this. I, I just find the like uh, the idea of waiting for this November election kind of eerily familiar. Yeah. Like, uh, what, like, what, do, what do people think of the like the say the political state in America currently? About people are just kind of it's like they're all on, on a pausing for just waiting for this event to come in a similar fashion than the party of order. I think the election itself may be without interest. It, that's kind of my feeling, but I don't know. Derek, what do you think? Or Moog? Like We're fucked. We're so fucked. Like, like the election will not matter very much. Uh, Trump, will, Trump will probably lose because the economy is going to go bad. And because he has discredited himself with the elderly, which is kind of fucking amazing. But like that's that's the trend that's been kind of shocking. Um, the the short term benefits are clear, like that we've had the, the initial opening up led to an immediate economic like 
blip, but it was a blip of 2% after a loss of what, 15 to 20? And, and the worst is yet to come. And anyone who can see that, that, that these band-aids that the Democrats and Republicans together conjured up to put on the situation is about to fall apart. So yeah, things are bad. Um, and it's not clear to me what the, anyone's going to care about the election anymore. Because no one really believes that the Democrats are going to, like, you know, the Democrats are going to, like, bend a knee and kente cloth and talk about shooting people in the legs. Like, who thinks they're going to be able to do shit? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's going to be, there's basically going to be the gridlock we've seen for the last few years until we get, you know, cue scary music, uh, some other authority, quote unquote, um, emerging. Um, as of now, it's sort of like all sections of American society are in such disarray that I'm not really sure where it's going to come from. Um, but that, I think, is the trajectory. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's kind of like just getting on to Derek said like there about like the all the Democrats wearing kente cloth. It, it, it sounds like a really crap reboot of The Punisher. We have Joe Biden wearing like, you know, an Afro suit and shooting people in the legs. <laughs> oh dear. Maybe, maybe the maybe the public health experts will begin reading fascist books and uh, you know uh, <laughs> find ways to scare everyone into giving them authority. Maybe uh, Deborah Burks will be our new overlord. Well, I do worry about like the liberal tendency to see the non-repressive apparatuses of the state to come in and fix everything, like like a bunch of teachers, social work, workers, and community mm -hmm. nurses are going to be able to replace the cops and uh, in, in an economic downturn. Like, yeah. that's insane. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, you know, my, my mother was a social worker, and I was talking to her about it, and she said, well, you know, the social work, like, when I was a social worker, and, and since then, the social workers have basically been bullied into performing police duties anyway. Like they're a part of the uh, the repressive apparatus. Same they're, thing they're... with the schools, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and I know when people say all these things about social workers and teachers, they mean some kind of platonic ideal of health and education, but you have to work with the state you have and not with the state you haven't. Mm -hmm. Well, unless you smash it, smash it, smash it. Smash it! Yeah, up. exactly. Smash it up. Yes. <laughs> smash that like, smash that like button. Button. That's what I say. This is the communism for the YouTube. Smash the like button. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe a revolutionary have... program for our times, Tom. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> that will surprise us all, and it will, you know, take advantage of forty-two million unemployed to spread <laughs> the new commune across the states. Uh, this 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 ep this episode will have you know twenty six views and four fourteen point two million likes. That's what I'm aiming for. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is I was like, you know, well, according to people in in Seattle, there's some kind of SoundCloud rapper warlord that everyone keeps referring to. So maybe that is the future. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. like those guys, those guys in New York, the models giving the headshots to the crowd to, to the police. <laughs> The brand ambassador uh, insurrectionaries. Did anybody read about all the fakery with that uh, Black Panther crew in Atlanta? How oh, she was an actress. Yeah. That so stuff the, was the funny. funny thing about those Black Panther crews, I was reading about that. The funny thing about them, and I knew they were reactionary and sketch from the beginning because they're a split of a split of the new Black Panther Party, which itself was a black supremacist. Uh, organization that split from the nation of Islam and was completely disowned by most of the vocal Panthers. Um, and then you read that like they get actors involved in shit and, and then they do like posing with the cops. And it's just like, with friends like these, who needs COINTELPRO? Like you really don't. Yeah. People are also kind of, I think, understating the continuity with the original Black Panthers with that stuff, you know. Yeah, no, well, uh, somebody says, no, they're not MBPP. No, they weren't New Black Panther. I'm going to respond to that. They weren't New Black Panthers. They're New Black Panther revolutionaries. They may or may not be a, uh, they may, like, they, they may or may not be inspired by uh, some, some shit with the MBP. 
Um, it's been actually hard for me to follow up on. I do know, however, that the most of the people who were who were at the actual rallies had nothing to do with the other with the group that called itself that name, and they were mostly actors and people posing. Yeah, it looks like it was some kind of a. I don't know. Those type of people must be getting money from somewhere. It's got you know, got to be getting some weird ass money from some some weirdos. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they're just weirdos on their own. Um, well, okay. I mean, well, the thing here's the thing is there. It's hard to tell right now, and one of the things is the social media discourse doesn't help on it. But then people on the left tend to tend to like defend this shit. I actually resent having to talk about it. I don't think any of that matters no. at all. It's largely a fucking distraction, and um, you know in. in and like even in Seattle, where you have this massive um, issue of like disparity um, in these super rich cities, it is very interesting to me that leftists are fucking afraid of talking about how different the situation is um, in like Seattle, the Bay, and New York than it is in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul because you're dealing with average incomes that are like an order of magnitude different. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is in these areas that you see the second wave, they're predominantly white by like 80%. And so like, that's not discussed. People don't want to discuss it. And it's, it's actually kind of making me mad. And you know, I don't want to get into, you know, me threatening to like strangle half of the left, but, um, <laughs> Um, you know, like it is, it is something that's very frustrating for me because in, in a place like Minneapolis, we should be talking about like that attempt to run hotels and how they got sabotaged by trying to do progressive, uh, drug policy. Um, and you know, do, do like clean needles and then they have one overdose because they run out of Narcan and they get shut down. That's going to be like like it, when occupy in london here what they did to 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 really uh screw it up is that the 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 police kept on dropping off loads of people with, with drug problems and homeless people and telling them to go there you know systemically and people who were like released from prison and they would drop them out there and i think any any of these places that start uh doing this type of stuff you know just look to the what they did in the revolution in egypt they released all the prisoners you know, that th these are tactics that will be enacted by uh, the state when, if, if they feel like they need to. Yeah, you, to speak on that Egypt stuff, I, I remember talking to a former Brotherhood member um, who left um, because of how bad they had handled the situation afterwards. But they, they told me, like, yeah, the, the military stood on its hands and the police did all kinds of shit. But then the military started, like, actively um throwing disorder into the into society actively and uh, encouraging insane anti-semitic conspiracies about israel while also like taking israel's stance towards the palestinians more seriously um and and, and stuff like that like i think we're gonna see a lot of that i think we're gonna see a lot of like bat fuckery in our own ranks that are is like it'll be like low level cop interference the best is the actual cop paid de-escalation specialist who got shot in the testicles during the training session, so may have been sterilized. Oh my God, Grimlock! Thank you, autonomous friend of the people. Um, <laughs> well, um, I mean, you know, one of the things is you, you will also see a lot of like workers try to shit on the Chaz situation, and I, I'm not optimistic about Chaz either, but like, like as if it, you know, it's in the the capital um, of the economics of the United States cities are so fucking weird. So you either have massive gentrification problems that leads to things like Seattle and the Bay Area. Um, and so like the the intermediary working class with the quote unquote middle class is largely leaving those areas because they can't afford to live there. But poor people can't leave. They can't afford to leave. You know, like they're very, very poor. So you have like this increasing gap in those areas and so you have weird radicalism where you have like a strand of progressively educated like not like would-be workers uh would be or maybe even would be bourgeoisie frankly would be high-end workers 
who are unemployed and leading this stuff. And then you have this like big pool of people who have been completely shut out, but are stuck in the area. And um, that's definitely the case in Seattle. That's the case in the Bay Area. That seems to be somewhat the case in New York, although that the, they seem to handle it better. But that's a very different thing than like Minneapolis and St. Paul. If people know America, Minneapolis and St. Paul have been deracinated for a long fucking time. Yeah, they're like, they're, poor, they're poor cities now. Aren't they're they? poor cities. Most of the most of the industrial heartland is fucking hollowed out. Yeah. Like, and so it hasn't been surprising to me that you've seen the shift of racial struggle from these hollowed out heartland cities. That was also true for Ferguson, by the way. Like, look at the map. Um, yeah. Um, like, from the South, which has also been largely deracinated, but has been dealing with this for so much longer and is so much more demoralized and co-opted. Um, and, and then what happens next is it moves to these kind of richer cities where the where the disparity is so much larger, but it also seems like, like one of the things you'll notice is the language of the stuff coming out of Minnesota is not an activist language where the language and the stuff coming out of Seattle is. And I'm not saying that inherently is a sign of it being bad or fake or anything or that I'm not that condescending, but it does tell you that like, there's an educated left-wing subculture that at least has some sway on that stuff in Seattle and the Bay and in New York that it doesn't have in Minneapolis. And, and we don't know how to handle that. I mean, the, the, the thing, one of the things that I have been thinking about that's different from our time than the Brumaire is that in the Brumaire, the left was like, like Louis, like not Louis LeBlanc, I keep on wanting to call him Louis LeBlanc, but that's wrong. Blanc was literally trying to like have a, an educational dictatorship <laughs> <laughs> during this time period right before this led up to like train the working class to vote the right way. Didn't that sound like Joe Biden? It's the weirdest pink authoritarian shit, right? Um, and, uh, and they got totally sidelined. But the left in our time is in even more disarray. Like that was a left that hadn't come together yet. And now we're dealing with a left that has decayed largely since the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, I'm not feeling so good about it. I don't know. What does everyone else think? I'm going to shut up for a while. Um, uh, as a person in the chat did ask me what I mean by activist language, like the, if you see the second list of demands for some of the autonomous, and it may be fake, who fucking knows? It's hard to tell. Um, from the Seattle Chaz commune, like the, the minority list, it is written totally in like um, a critical race theory talk and in um, and stuff that you don't see in the same way from like the, uh, the people seizing hotels in Minneapolis and trying to serve homeless people. Yeah, I'd say regarding Chaz that like, it's kind of similar to the commune in a sense, because it's a situation where state authority has vacated an area and then activists come in and uh, set something up. It seems to be what's happened. Um, and I honestly, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know exactly how it's all going to go down, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to survive that long. Um, but I do, I do, I do hope there's something positive that comes out of it. And I do hope that it's not such a, it's not the disaster that the commune was. Well, I mean, the, we have to talk about the intermediary forms of the Arab Spring and Occupy both tried the same things, just Occupy never could get of any, anything significant to the state. Right, Sakati so, uh, Park is not Capitol Hill, but it it feels very similar. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that the state never really explicitly vacated that area. Right. Um, and, and in this case, they did. And so there was the declaration of autonomy that could be made and have, like, some limited credibility, which is already blown, right? Because the police chief was in there the other day, just, right. like, walking around. Um, yeah, I've heard that, too. Like I, I think also like on like these things are only performative unless the actual working class are doing it. I mean, as in 
all the working, like in Paris, like it was all the workers took control, you know. And here we have like some activists in a particular area take control. And it's just a, it's a different phenomenon. Just I mean, completely different. By, sorry, Tom, what do you mean by all the working class? Because that's like, that seems like a ridiculously high standard. Sorry, yeah, okay. And when I say all, I mean, uh, I'm being pejorative slightly, but you know what I mean? As in like the mass of the workers took control of like a, a, a large part of the city, say in, 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 the, in the commune, where here it's like, people probably that don't really even live there. There's probably not even businesses there. It seems more like, uh, you know, administrative center of part. I tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, I don't, there know are, there are businesses in the area that are like, still carrying on business. Okay. But like, it, it doesn't sound like the Paris commune. You know what I mean? It's like, no, I mean, one of the things thing. is it can't reproduce, like it can't re like Capitol Hill in Seattle doesn't have anything you could seize to reproduce itself. You know, Neither did Paris, to be fair. Like, well, they started the eating rats, you know? I mean, well, well I mean, that's one of the things about the commune is, like, like it seems so obvious in the, in the hindsight that there was no way it could survive. And so I'm not saying this, that the mayor of Seattle has studied the Paris commune at all, but it does seem like a logical tactical retreat to just go let them have it hope they burn it down if they don't give them three weeks wait till national media attention isn't on them and if you have to crush it do it after the larger waves of media attention are over because one of the things i think we might find with this one is if it, if it survives it will be crushed but they'll wait to do it until national national media attention is somewhere else yeah, like they they could wait. They they might wait a long time as well to crush it. They could literally wait six months, wait till Joe Biden's in there, and then do it like when there's like Super Bowl is on or something. I like, mean, I don't. It's not even. It's not even clear that they're going to have to crush it, right? It's possible that it just collapses out of internal tensions. That's what they hope. I mean, and one of the things that I've pointed out about COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO generally worked that way. The exception was. The Panthers and actually right wing movements where they actively, you know, would do shit to get people killed. But most of the time, they just try to accelerate internal tension so that things would fall apart on their own. And there are plenty of those to accelerate, right? I mean, it's just a thing on on what what Tom was saying about the workers. I feel like, I mean, although I I don't disagree. Like, you need to have some ability to lay your hands on something that could reproduce your revolt. I feel like though that's a little bit of putting the cart before the horse. Like the 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 whole problem that everyone's trying to solve is that we don't have that, um, yeah. at least in places that you know where revolts and uprisings take place, or at least places where like left wing action you know um, seems to happen. So that so the problem that everyone's trying to solve on the left and has been trying to solve for a long time is how do you, you know how do you solve how do you deal with the fact that the places in which you can do anything like left politics are totally distanced from the places that are actually important to get social control, right? Well, um, I mean, I've been pointing that out for a while that I'm afraid that like the abandonment of the Rust Belt and these deracinated and somewhat slightly more egalitarian, but downwardly so areas of the United States have been largely abandoned by leftists because they don't feel like they can talk to those people. And that's yet where the epicenter of these, like BLM comes out of that and then moves to the other areas, partly because remaining in that kind of activist mode is fucking deadly. And, and even in the United States, that'll get you killed. Whereas you can be a community activist in a major city you know, talking about Black Lives Matter as adjacent to the Democratic Party, and you might even make money from it. And, like, I can't even blame people for taking that gambit, you know? Like, I wouldn't want to risk it either. Yeah, I mean, it's on the on the other, I agree with what you just said, Derek. And on the other side, there's, like, an equal problem with people in cities talking about the need to, you know, go to the Rust Belt, um, which is true. Like, that's, that's, that's an important, that's a thing people have to do, but it just ignores the fact that, like, there's a reason people in the left are in cities, right? Like that's, you know, anyways. What's the reason, I mean, I agree with you, but what's the reason why they're in affluent cities? Affluent cities, well, I mean, that's the, like, 
leftist radicalization is largely a product of like you know university milieus now more and more um, and media media hubs yeah exactly so the left that we have is not the left that we want yes exactly right. but like look look what's the what what if you were to say what percentage of the u.s population would you say right now are politics are similar either like commie revolutionary socialists or even just radical social democrats almost impossible to tell like i mean it, it's impossible oh. to tell because a lot of people using those words actually mean very milk toast things by them um but i know but just just your general just a general would you say I, it's 10 maybe maybe two percent radical and then ten percent adjacent yeah yeah so like if that's the truth and we know that all like most of the radicals like you, you know just look at who listens to my podcast who we are all most of them are college educated uh a lot of times live in uh cities that are the richer cities so it's like because our 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 actual movement is so small and it's concentrated into these small areas like it's just it's a sign of the weakness of our movement currently you know it's Agreed. like these these things like chaz and occupy are a function of the weakness you know that that's really what they are but you if know only, if only hopefully tom things are moving ago, if only tom two weeks ago could have heard you right now yeah tom tom you said like week, last week, week. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I've had some sleep, Derek. I was sleep fucking deprived. I was paranoid out of my mind. I didn't know what was going on. So if I let you, if I let you stay up for four days, you will lead the purges, is what you're telling me. Um, no, no. If you if you leave me up for four days, I will be I will be fucking dialectical. I mean, dialectical ecstasy. That's what actually happened. <laughs> Spirit of the revolution. I, you guys have you, you've no idea, right? About two o'clock in the morning, the night before that. I was saying, Precious said something to me, and I was like, my God. And I jumped out of bed, and I turned the light on, and I was dancing in the fucking room. I shit you not. <laughs> I was like, I was fucking, I was like somebody had just, I'd been on cocaine for five days straight. I, I'm not shitting you. History, <laughs> history was on horseback on every street corner. Uh, well, that's, seriously. That's what, what was really scary was like you on four hours of sleep was like quite a substantial portion of the online left. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I was, in fairness though I was in a, a large proportion of the online left for those four days and let's be honest I tweeted probably more in four <laughs> days than I've, like probably ten times more than I've tweeted in my entire fucking life um, <laughs> yeah it makes me think seriously it makes me think about like what people's state of mind is when they're on Twitter it's, it's truly like, toxic it's, 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 it's weird. truly truly yeah, toxic it's it weird. is a horrible like, Skinner box um after after coming through for like about three days, like uh, and not realizing I was in it, I was like, "Fuck me, that was weird." You know, it's a very weird. It's like it's not a thing that's good for people's mental health. It's fucking. No. It's opposite for us. Actually, like uh, uh, you know, after last week, I got off. I sighed, <laughs> got a beer, and then um, <laughs> avoided all social media for five days. But, the, you know, for yeah. my context, like I was also down thing? here, we were dealing with our own stuff right after the death of, I mean, um, of Bernardo out here. And, um, you know, I went out to that, like, um, after we left you guys, I went out to that protest and, like, it was raining and you couldn't hardly get there. And there was thousands of people there and nothing violent happened, but... It was really disheartening because in the local groups here in SLC, like, and I, I'm, I'm not just talking about like Marxist groups or whatever. I'm actually talking about like groups mostly of color. Like there were circling the ragons against each other, like calling out official BLM and then like who had the right to do that. You know, could white people call out official BLM? It, it was, it was so, it was so disheartening. And it it took it took literally a week to get to that state, and then when you know, and so I'm listening to you on like your your sleep deprived ecstasy, and then my experience of it here, it's just like, man, we're so fucked, like like we can't stop arguing with each other over the pettiest of shit immediately. But I would I would think Derek, um, 
that it's it's like that thing that Mark said in earlier in one of the chapters where he he was talking was it about the the pure Republicans where he was talking about like how if they were going to make the thing that they stood on against Napoleon something to do with the army the army would never back them unless the 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 uh, the thing was so important and I think that similarly with all these you know us in but us us too including us and how we behave and all that it's a function of kind of the meaninglessness of what we're doing is that we don't unite and i think that like that stuff will dissipate to a, 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 it will dissipate not to i'm not saying it'll all go but i think the tendency will when things get serious and real that it will bring together those that that are currently apart to a large extent or just split them off you know actually make them an enemy as opposed to just this rubbish in you know i would agree with you too but i i keep on wondering if that's going to happen soon enough before like repression happens and that's what i've been feeling lately is like that the, the, the real movement isn't quite there yet. There's still a whole lot of neutral people. I mean, one of the things I can tell you here, and I'm in the teachers union, it's the teachers union has not said a fucking word about any of this. Nothing. It's been... Why I mean, is that, do you think? Because one, I mean, like, uh, the teachers union here is much more conservative than most of the rest of the country, considering who's going to make it up. But um, two... Um, I think also like there's an ambivalence like most teachers don't love cops they don't like the, the people that particularly if you're teaching in a city and not in the suburbs the people that you're that you're serving are the people whose parents are getting their heads cracked in by the police um, but at the same time like there's a huge distrust between you and those communities a lot of the time um you're not from that community in most of these areas um i mean it even rationally like if i was a first generation college student and for you know from a background that was impoverished of an immigrant or or of color would i fucking become a teacher no i'd go make some real money or get some real power i'd become a lawyer or, or a business owner like come on like so like that's a that's kind of an issue where i'm at and so they're strategically quiet about it and we don't really know what to do about the fact that like in the united states i don't know the percentage but i'm i'm actually assuming the fop the fraternal the fraternal order of police is a high percentage of the 17 percent unionization of the country i know the largest is the teachers unions and then there's nursing unions and those are both very large and i'm suspecting that after that it's the it's the police unions the thing is, even like in most states that ban, that, there are some states that ban um, public sector unions. They have to call themselves associations and can't do a lot of uniony stuff. Um, the the FOP still exists. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's like um, I just think like I, I don't know how much the repression mm -hmm. will be, Derek. To be honest with you, because I don't think the threat is that big. I think the you know, it, yeah. is it of a similar order to to the nineteen sixties? Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know the what would you call the nineteen sixties race movement or the? Yeah, well, they were called the, the civil rights. There's the ghetto riots and the civil the rights movement. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, to me, are they? Is it? You know, we're talking about like when the when the when the capitalist state gets really threatened it's when there is a workers revolutionary movement and that doesn't exist yet it's there's a sock dem kind of movement and there's a small bit and there's some race stuff going on as well and like uh, so i don't think the repression is going to be much worse than the cointel pro 70s repression unless things really kick off in the next few months which, they, know, they, which they really could mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that these grew up so big seems like, to be related to the fact that we're in an economic crisis and no one has anything to do. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean that's one, the... one thing I would say. One thing I would know. Go on, is that a mug? Oh a yeah, mug yeah. yeah. Kyle, no, I was, was going to say that that's the that's in a way the the slightly worrying thing that you know um, how much of this is going to how much of this 
I, I sometimes worry that a lot of the up unrest is like, you know, people getting the chance to go outside and how much of that is going to remain in a kind of reopen, more relaxed environment. Like how much of the unrest is going to be channeled into <laughs> people going back into restaurants and stuff. I mean, that's a, so that sounds a bit flippant, but like, I'm sure we can imagine less frivolous examples than restaurants. One thing I have noticed though, online, just from my weirdo Twitter uh, view is that like the number of like leftists who are now saying, oh, you, you got to buy some guns. <laughs> that has gone up a fuck load. Well, I mean, I you know, I gave up guns ten years ago, and I am definitely thinking about picking them back up again. So, well, you just put them down the ground ten years ago, and now you're going to pick them up again. Yeah, I put them down because I didn't feel like I was going to. I don't believe in holding a gun unless you intend to ki unless you intend to kill people. So, you know, <laughs> I wasn't in the killing people phrase of mind. So, like, I wasn't going to have a gun, and and I didn't figure I would need it. And now I don't. I don't feel that that is true anymore. Like, if, in in the if 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 things get really chaotic, I might need it. No, do I think like the Socialist Rifle Association is going to leave a workers' revolution? No, because the state can bomb us in thirty seconds. But um, we're not delusional, like like libertarian militia nuts. But we do need to be realistic about like counterforce and and uh, social instability and then like random right-wing weirdos attacking us because that whole leaderless resistance is good for one thing and that's generating terrorism and there's a lot of it that's true okay um i think we'll take it offline unless anybody has anything else to say before we go may we finish the chapter next time fucking a yeah, we at least talked about it. We've been taking we took two mm. weeks off. So <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm ever gonna fucking edit those fucking shit shows. Maybe the first one. The first one was good. The second one, that's going into the <laughs> flush down the fucking toilet. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do what Doug did with all his fucking conspiracy theory shit from about ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> our, our actually even my first appearance on the show has been has been memory hold. Your one, what yeah. was that? the one where it where he asked me to, to talk about the difference between left wing politics and the occult. Um, <laughs> <and then> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what is the difference? <laughs> like like uh, Amo, do you remember that episode? The I do, I do. I think it's one of the <laughs> very first things that I heard from you. And then oh. the second one was me talking about Althusser and like I don't understand how you can be a Marxist humanist and an Althusserian anti-humanist at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> those have been gently flushed. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a whole lot. I'm surprised someone dug up all the the original Pop the Left episodes and released them. Um, and actually transcribed them, and I read them, and I'm like, oh my god, we were fucking morons. <laughs> like, like oh. and anyway, they were they were, they were good at the time, Derek. Cool. They were good at the time. Yeah, the, 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 some of them were. Don't listen to the first episode, um, and ignore, um, ignore Nick Pale because you know within a month of finishing his two episodes, he becomes a fascist, and. Uh, and I'm not. That is not me throwing the the, the f word around, you know, willy nilly either. So it's like, yeah, there's all these weird figures who I've since forgotten about, like Henry Flint and the uh, Zerzen and all these people. Yeah. Oh God, the Henry Flint episode. That's oh, actually yeah, that yeah. actually is good. Um, but yeah. So who's Henry Flint? Henry Flint was this weird like. Like artist who also was a like hyper left com who got really weirdly obsessed with weird shit Stalin was doing, like his uh, weird quasi genetics uh, eugenics program and and uh, but he was one of those people that said that U.S. that the USSR's communism was basically war capitalism, um, which I think is a little bit unsophisticated, but uh, not not entirely wrong. But I mean, it, it's interesting to go back and listen to these podcasts and uh, what ha what we have kind of censored over time ourselves. 
Um, uh, Amoga and I uh, put, put, put our uh, episodes up, that, and but even some of ours are pretty lost. Amog, do you remember reporting the recording the Paul Godfrey episode that has never seen the light of day that I can't find? I do, <laughs> I do. I remember. I remember that was one of the ones where uh, we were reading like chunks of text or something. From yeah, Godfrey. I read like large sections of reactionary text and talked about it and like. It was funny because someone was like, you've obviously never heard of the alt-right the other day. And I just started laughing and laughing. <laughs> like. <laughs> oh, God. Right here, let's take this offline. All right, let's, let's reminisce. Offline, guys. Too much. Bye, everyone. Like, Bye. Thanks, thanks, everybody, in the chat. There's too many is in there to, to give you all Thank a shout-out. We'll do it next week. Uh, um, uh, yeah, next week we finish this more full chapter. We've only got two and a half chapters left. All let's right. do it. Yeah, this one 